why I was so afraid there, for example. So I'll do things like that all the time to try and trigger the actual emotion. So if I noticed the emotion inside of me, I would then go and do what I was afraid of doing to trigger that emotion. And I had to do that all the time. Uh, it was the only way I could access emotion at the beginning. Now it's totally different. Now what I can do is I can just sit, sit with myself quietly and I pray and long to God to help me deal with this emotion. And I just sit there and just all I do is think, just let myself free think, if you like, which, or I would call it free feeling, and just free feel what pops into my head at the moment. And in, within a few seconds usually, there's a, the feelings pop there and, and then straight away I allow the connection with the emotion. But you go to a, you've got to allow the grieving emotion. So for most people, like you look at a child and the way a child pro, pro, uh, looks at emotion. How do, how do they process their emotion? An event happens, they're in their emotion. Right, there's, no, there's no delay, is there? The event happens and they're in. Uh, there's very little delay. And if there isn't any delay, it's usually because their mother or father has suppressed the expression of emotion, right? Now, in the end, that's where you can do that. You can instantly go into the emotion as soon as, as, soon as the event occurs and fully experience the emotion. Now, the reason why we don't is because we've got all of these blockage layers over the top of the, that process. And so what I've found myself is that the only thing that can access initially when you're in a state where you're not feeling all of your emotions, then there are blockages that need to be released. So if you can imagine your soul, so, so I'll just draw the soul again. So here's your soul, and it has the emotion right, right deep down in the, emotion, in the emotion of empty, like it just feels totally empty. Now, what we do is we surround ourselves with protections around that emotion, right? And they become our blockages, if you like, to feeling that emotion. So the first thing that we need to do is unravel the blocks, and that becomes the most difficult process that you will experience in your emotional processing work. Unraveling the blockages to actually experiencing the emotion. When it comes to experiencing the emotion, you'll probably, in the end, quite enjoy it and feel quite good afterwards once you've experienced the emotion. But actually unravelling it to get to the emotion or unravelling all the blockages is the hardest thing. Right? And I've found that very, very difficult at times where I've spent months unravelling blockages to feeling the emotion. My soulmate emotions of loss of my soulmate, I've just had huge... And the reason why I stayed in this relationship and cried about it for seven years was because of the huge blockages I had to feeling the pain of the soulmate separation emotions. Yeah. So, so the key is to be willing to feel everything. And, uh, but you don't get there instantly. It's not, you, know, you don't jump from being unwilling to feel everything to being willing to feel everything. There's all these blockages that need to be pulled out of you along the way. So if you could think of all the blockages as emotional error inside of you. Error, I mean beliefs that you have that you believe to be true. For example, how many of you believe that your mum and dad did a good job raising you? That's going to be a major block for you processing emotion. <laughs> right? The reason why is because, because that belief says, that belief is really saying emotionally, I'm not allowed to criticise my mum and dad for anything they did now. Now that also then, if we take that one step further, means that if I have an emotion, a feeling inside of me that says that's of anger with my mum and dad for something that they did, I can't release it because it's unfair. So straight away that one belief is going to shut down a whole group of childhood emotions. That makes sense for you? Yeah. And so this is where, so what's the block? The block is the guilt associated with feeling that mum and dad did something wrong when all of your life they're trying to tell you they did the best they could. And you now believe they did the best they could. And you know what? You may be right. And you probably are right. But this is what we often do with emotions. What we do is we say, here's our end point. Here's where we are right now. Here's all the emotional baggage in between. All right? in between, and what we do is we intellectually jump from there to there. 
And then we say, you beauty, I've dealt with everything. <laughs> and nothing in our life changes very much because this emotional baggage is what's in the soul causing all the attractions and it's the attractions that cause your life. All right? So unless you're willing to experience this baggage, remember, when you're a child, what happens? You have the emotional event occurs and you experience it straight away. So someone comes up and punches you in the arm, what do you do? Sit down and have a big cry. And a lot of times, what do we hear parents saying? Oh, he's not really crying about the hurt, because it didn't hurt him very much. Mm. Yeah, here it hurt him. <laughs> it hurt him enough for him to cry for half an hour. That's where, that's where it hurt him. Not, not there, in the punch in the arm, but in his heart, how can some, the feeling of how can somebody come up and punch me? How can, you know, why, what does that mean inside of myself? What does it mean when somebody wants to hurt me like that? Why do they want to hurt me like that? There's all these emotions in there, right? And when we say to ourselves, stop crying, that didn't hurt, what are we really saying? We're really saying, you can experience this hurt, the physical one, you know, the one that's broken your arm or whatever, but you can't experience this hurt, the emotional one. That, and it's the emotional one that defines the rest of their life. Right? So, what we all need to come to realise is, all these emotions that were denied through our childhood, and all of us have emotions denied during our childhood, all of those emotions are what is right now defining our life. Now, each one of those emotions are snap freezes in time. So, so let's say three years old, some little child in the kindergarten came up and punched me in the arm and kicked me and, and I just laid down on the floor crying and then the, then the kindergarten teacher came up and said, what are you crying about? You don't need to cry, it wouldn't hurt that much. And all of that emotion was shut down. Now, that emotion now is inside of you frozen. You can think of it like being in a freezer waiting for you to thaw it out, waiting for you to experience it. Because you didn't experience it fully when it happened. That's the only reason why we have to do this, because we didn't experience it fully when it happened. That make sense? So, if you want to intellectually jump from one to another, and this is something that almost all spiritual methodologies do, is they jump from the point where I am now, so this point is I am here right now, right? This point is where I know I should be. Right? <laughs> and so what we do is we then jump from that one point to the other point. We learn all of these things, all these spiritual techniques and all of these things, meditation and other techniques. And so what we do is we use that tool to jump from one location to the other location and skip over and deny and actually don't experience all of the baggage that gets us there real. So this is what's real, this is just a fake thing. And most of us in our own spiritual progression has, have done the fake thing. And we need to be honest about that, and we need to get back to doing the real thing, which is the emotional experience. That's the real thing. So what about um, the people who have reached those points? So they, they're still, even though they maybe in a state of enlightenment, say, yep. do they still have um, a shitload of emotions hiding underneath? Many times, yes. Um, do you remember the channeling? If you watch the DVDs, you remember Lucinda's channeling. Mm -hmm. Lucinda was a six fear spirit. Now, six fear spirit has been perfected in natural love. So, in other words, they are living now in what they feel is a state of bliss, right? Right at that moment. And they feel they have no emotional baggage left. And then she said, and I don't know if you remember the comment, that she needed to become real. And she went back to the third sphere and learnt a heap of things about herself that she wasn't being real about. And this is exactly the process we need to do too. And many of the people who are on earth who are in a state of enlightenment are actually in a state of detunement. They're not in a state of enlightenment. And in fact, if they were in a state of true enlightenment, they would never even say they are enlightened. Right? Because enlighten, enlightenment, we were talking about this myself and, and Grant this morning, about what enlightenment is. And enlightenment, everybody starts thinking of enlightenment as an end point. Like, that, like that's when, when you reach enlightenment, that's, that's it. But the way God created the universe is... <coughs> And uh, who, who hates Bible quotes? Be honest. 
okay. Well, you're going to get triggered a bit today, too. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11 in the Bible says, God has put time indefinite into their hearts so that they may never find out what the true God has done. In other words, God inbuilt inside of you, and this is a truth of the universe, that God has built infinite infinity inside of you. He's built the desire for everlasting life inside of you. Why do you think you put on potions and take pills and all those things? Isn't it so that you can live longer and happier, isn't it? In just about all cases. You know, how many of you look in the mirror each day and notice the wrinkle and say, you know, it doesn't feel good having the wrinkle, does it? Why doesn't it feel good? Because it doesn't feel right, does it? It doesn't feel right. It's not what you feel inside. It's not a reflection of that. It doesn't seem. And so it doesn't feel right. And that is the truth. The truth is that God has made you to be an everlasting being. Even in your physical form, it's possible. God has made you to do that. And inside of your soul, there's this feeling that that's true. And you don't know how that's true, and you don't know how you can achieve that, perhaps. But there's a feeling inside. And that feeling inside is what drives you for truth and drives you to feel like you're younger than you really are or all of those kind of things, right? That's, that's that truth. And this is the case with a lot of our feelings, is a lot of our feelings are driven by truths that we don't understand as truths yet and we don't understand how they're achievable. Right? So when we do this jumping, and, I, and there was part of the question that I just, that's just flicked my mind now too, because it was really important, but anyway, when we do this jumping intellectually from one place to another, what happens is we're skipping over all this emotional baggage and it's all the emotional baggage that is going to make the experience real. And if you decide you want to become an enlightened being, then in the end, true enlightenment is understanding that you are a perpetual student. Right? Because you think about it, if God's infinite, and God's built everlasting life into your heart, a desire for everlasting life inside of you, then obviously you're going to be perpetually learning, aren't you? Okay. Now, what happens with our, on the development of, this, of the six spirits, if you like, the natural love, is they're developing themselves intellectually, skipping over emotional development, developing themselves intellectually and morally, and many times doing some emotional work as a byproduct but skipping over many things within themselves, many truths within themselves. And they get to the sixth sphere, but they can't progress any further because their heart isn't in it. Right? There's all this false self-beliefs that have covered over the true feelings <coughs> inside the heart. So right now, you have within you all of these beliefs about yourself that you think you are, but you're not. And then you have all these beliefs that you've got no idea about yourself that you are. And you, many of you choose to present the false self to everyone else. So this is where relationships become very difficult because I'm choosing to present a false image of myself to the, my partner, but it's not how I'm really feeling. Right? It doesn't work either. And it doesn't work in the long run, no. That's why we eventually finish up breaking up or having a terrible relationship. Yeah, because it just doesn't work. The only thing that is going to work is truth. Truth is what actually establishes a love bond, and that's the only thing that's going to work. That, what is truth? <coughs> truth is total emotional nakedness. So how many of you don't want to be emotionally naked? <laughs> a lot of you. More than what put up their hands. <laughs> yeah. And the reason, and the reason why? Why don't you want to be totally emotionally naked? <laughs> because, uh, yeah, issues of vulnerability. Uh, that makes me vulnerable. Actually, do you know, it's actually totally the opposite. T being totally emotionally naked makes you more powerful. But you just believe, it's a false belief, that it makes you more vulnerable. How many people feel that if you tell the truth, people will hurt you with it? Yeah, I mean, it's a common belief, right? Yeah. Why do people lie? Because of that, because of that <laughs> false belief. That false belief that if I tell the truth, I'm going to get pain. So how many times does that actually happen in life? All the time, doesn't it? Right from a young age. How many times have you with your own children said, tell me the truth, tell me the truth, they tell you the truth and you give them a belt? 
<laughs> How many times have you done that? So what has that taught them? <laughs> truth, pain, truth, pain, truth, pain. <laughs> right? And then, and then so, what, so what happens then? Of course they're not going to tell you the truth the next time, are they? They're going to do everything but tell you the truth. And then you say to them, you know, I'm really disappointed in you. You never told me the truth. <laughs> of course they never told you the truth, right? And, and this is what you learnt growing up, is to not tell the truth, not live in truth, not be exactly how you feel inside.